good. I've been looking forward to introducing Rob and Diane for a long time. I started going to summer session and after I retired around 2008. And the first time I was there, I saw this course. I can't remember the name of it. I said, what does that have to do with anything? And then we wear name badges and it says your name and the name of your course. I talked to a couple of people. What is that course about? I said, that is really interesting. So anyway, I signed up the next year. I think, you know, I like geography and it was at uh, postal geography and then postal ephemera that I enjoyed. And then uh, there's going to be another one in 2012. That was when my wife got ill. So I had to, can I had to cancel them. I haven't been back to one, but uh, really interesting material. It's like looking at things sideways and a different whole advantage of, 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 of the hobby and, and the additions, and you'll see it. Um, Robert Dalton Harris, PhD, theoretical physicist, turned his hobby into the livelihood in 1973. And after her car broke down in a snowstorm and he rescued her, Diane Dubois joined him as a partner in business and in life. Together for 15 years, they published PS, a quarterly journal of postal history. Together, they have edited the Postal History Journal since 2000. Together, they are awarded the highest award of the Ephemera Society in 2008, the Left Award for Philatelic Research in 2016. They're in the American Stamp Dealers Association Hall of Fame and the APS Writers Hall of Fame. They've presented at national, international conferences on postal, economic, and business history. Uh, and, and they said to edit, and so I've, I've just edited. So <laughs> that's been great. So Rob, uh, Diane, it's all yours. Uh, if you want to share your screen and um, if you could send me a copy of your uh, uh, I shall. PowerPoint and then I'll, yeah, I'll get that up. It. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Ready. And, oh, well, I just wanted to add that Paul was one of our favorite students. Uh, <laughs> cool. that's, that's a part I cut out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys are great. So we're looking forward to tonight. Good. <clears throat> So can everybody see that? Yes. But, oh, well, this was, well, definitely, this was the most fun that the two of us have had in doing really intensive research into do, giving a presentation. Sideways. Sideways. This, right. is, this is our most intensive sideways research yet. <laughs> uh, in 2018, we responded to a call for papers. Um, that was distributed by a postal history society in Prato, Italy. And their idea was to bring together an international conference on postal history, but that postal history should reach out to other disciplines. And we thought, hmm, okay, so we've reached out to economics and we've reached out to business history. Why don't we reach out to art, to art history and art analysis. And because this was going to be an international group, we thought, okay, let's look at American paintings of post offices. But these were paintings called genre paintings, where by and large, it was European artists coming to America and finding in the American scene what they called genre scenes, but also the people. That is situations that were, were, were quintessentially American. And we wanted to set this up, particularly emphasizing newspapers in a tavern post office and a genre of, of, of following a people. This is something that did not happen in Europe. This was something which was remarked when Europeans came to America that people were sitting around reading the newspaper in the woods. Uh, and indeed, it was their way of, they imagined, and as it was a matter of policy, to uh, make a coherent community out of a disparate uh, amalgam of people coming from the old world. So in Italy, we chose three paintings, but tonight we're only going to look at one, and uh, we'll tell you about it in a minute. But in this first slide, we want you to look at the... This, this newspaper that had been folded up and put in a bundle and sent through the mail. We have a, a several bundles of this particular newspaper. And what that shows is that when you open up the newspaper to read it, there's going to be all these fold lines. 
So keep that in mind when you look later. A, a, a newspaper which has been carried by the mail will be multiply creased. So uh, let's see. Do you see yourselves on the right of the screen? Anybody? Is yes, that? We, yes, we can yes. see us on well, the right. Yeah, you know what? I want to get rid of that. Let me see so that it doesn't encroach on the Sweet. Slide it up from the bottom. Just take your, your cursor, hold it down, and you yeah, I'm trying to find the cursor now. Uh oh, no, backwards. Uh huh. <laughs> Can't see your cursor. Can't do it. Well, I saw some. You saw something yeah. move. On, on top, there are some icons. And yeah, then not, there's nothing because I'm screen sharing and it's the oh, slideshow. Okay. Mine says hi, yeah. For the moon in the sky. Right, I'm looking for the moon it. in the sky. Right, well. So get to a place where you can, okay. Okay, for well, now. Well, now, we'll just carry on. Uh, uh, we'd like to ask, how many of you have seen this painting? Raise your hands among yourselves, count them. Uh, how many uh, do you, can you, can we estimate it? Uh, Oh, we can't see the everybody, okay. but but this is we called it the most famous. Um, it's not a very large painting, as you can see, thirty inches by twenty two, and a reproduction of this hangs on the wall in the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. Um, so that that's one of the clues that it's one of the most famous, but it also has been reproduced many other times. Because it's so early and it's sort of essentially American. So, first of all, we want you to look at what's happening on the left of the painting. What's happening is uh, a stagecoach is arriving at this tavern. Now, the painter John Lewis Krimmel was a German. He arrived in Philadelphia in 1809. And we, since he called it in a village tavern, clearly this was not Philadelphia. So where would he have gone to paint this painting? And we postulated that he would have chosen a comfortable route in a stagecoach where he could be the passenger. And then along the route, he would find a tavern that was also a post office. And the most comfortable route out of Philadelphia at the time the was- The major route going west. Was the Lancaster Turnpike Road. Um, here is a stock certificate that was issued in 1795, which was the first year that the Turnpike was actually completed. And at the time it contained, or it included the only toll gates in the country, and was the only road that had broken stone and a gravel surface so that it was the most comfortable road possible. So, so our hypothesis, we were looking to uh, locate that that tavern perhaps was along the Lancaster Turnpike. So, if so, well, who had the contract for the mail along the Lancaster Turnpike? Well, in 1814, which was the year of the painting, a John Tomlinson and Company had the contract between Philadelphia and Lancaster for $2,000 a year. He also note that he, could, he went from Lancaster to Chambersburg. And then at the bottom of the list, you can see that Tomlinson and Gadsby also did the Baltimore to Lancaster. Lancaster, Baltimore. For so another. they were stage, staging operators on the major roads in that area. And they commandeered a lot of the funds available for contract routes in Pennsylvania at the time. So then on a postal route map of the time, you can see that between Philadelphia and Lancaster, there's only one place noted, and that's Downings, that's exactly halfway 
um, on the map, 33 miles in each direction. And, and given the uh, rate of staging, uh, that is the rate of travel, horses and drivers, that was a, a, a relatively extreme staging point to travel at this case, probably five hours between Philadelphia and down. They may well have stopped uh, to change horses inter in an intermediate place, okay. but that's a, that's a long ride. So we thought, all right, let's take a look at Downings, which is now called Downing Town. And is <clears throat> there a inn or a tavern in Downing Town that would suit us? Well, the nice thing is that there's a painting that's attributed to John Lewis Crimmel called George Washington in a Village. And there was a George Washington Inn in Downing Town, and it was built in the 1750s as the King's Arm Inn. And then, of course, it changed names after the revolution. And it was the first post office in Chester County um, in 1796. And on the right, you can see the George Washington Inn today. So, so it would have to have been on the National Register. Yeah, well, well, we'll find out. Okay, so here we are. So we'll say, all right, so we're in the George Washington Inn, and we're in Downing Town. And here is that... We're, we're looking at the door now. We're come, What's coming through the door? And the what's coming through the door is the person in charge of the mail on the stagecoach. And over his shoulder, there's a locked bag. And I, some of you may have seen these leather mail bags that are, are quite long. They have handles at either end, which you can't see in the, um, in the painting. And then over his arm, he has a basket filled with something or other. Well, what we, we laughed when we read our, the first uh, analysis of this painting and the most popular said, this is a basket of bread. <laughs> Eight hours um, rest. No, 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 no. This whatever. is not a basket of bread. This actually <laughs> is a basket of bundles of newspapers. And newspapers at the time were required to, if they were wished to be sent through the mail, they were required to be put in bundles of no more than 20 and wrapped in plain paper and tied with string. And then more than one bundle could be then put together and tied with string again with the destination post office marked. And they were to be marked, these bundles, S for subscribers or P for free exchange copies to printers. And Rob and I would love to find a piece of plain wrapping paper from that period with an S or a P on it, but e have easily, not. Easy, easily produced, but hard to find. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so here are bundles of newspapers <clears throat> arriving at the same time as the mail. And that's the letters as in the as same the, mail. Sorry, the letter mail, the locked bag mail. Yeah. So that's particularly important, or it was for our European audience because such was not the case in Europe. Um, the newspapers did not accompany the mail, and, but were handled separately. And um, it was one of the innovations that Benjamin Franklin, as he did much else, um, introduced when he was uh, postmaster general under the British. Uh, that's in 1755 with John Hunter. Right. Yeah. So here we are with the mail and the newspapers arriving. So Crimmel, when he was imagining this painting in 1813, he did two sketches, just watercolor color, color over pencil. These sketches are in the Winter Tour collection. And you can see that he was always interested in this arrival of the mail. You can see the mailman or the mail carrier with the mailbag in both versions before he has figured out what to do with the other characters. Should we call attention to the other details which Not are yet. involved? No. <laughs> okay. okay. So 
So let's look at the um, person. Oh, oh, and this is another. This is uh, also 1813, but this is um, a more complete version of his of what he was thinking about for the painting. It's almost got everything of the final painting in it. And we wanted you to look at the barkeep. So that's the bartender or the barkeeper in the barkeep, which is the cage that could be locked so that um, with shutters so that the alcohol could be locked away. And then also have a look on the left side of the painting and look what's happening over there. So there's the publican or the barkeep and keeper. And what he's doing with his left hand, it took me a while to figure out what that was. He's muddling a stein or a mug of grog, grog being watered um, rum with probably some flavoring warmed and to clarify whatever it is that you've added to it, often the egg white is cracked into it and then you muddle it. And then on the left side of the painting, you can see that the person sitting with his feet on the stove, there he's left his mug or stein of grog on top of the stove to keep it warm. And I mentioned it's called a nine plate stove. It was a particularly popular stove at the time where um, it could be uh, fed from the front instead of from the top. So back to the painting. And having said that the newspapers are arriving with the mail, well, that means that the tavern is also receiving newspapers presumably for subscribers, but also for the tavern itself. And on the wall of the tavern, there are newspapers placed available to be read by patrons. So you can see the, the one behind that woman's head, it has been trapped in one of those reading sticks or uh, library sticks. And we imagined or Primmel might have imagined, coming from Philadelphia, that these newspapers might have been, oh, something like the political and commercial Paulson's American Daily Advertisers and Rife's Philadelphia Gazette and Daily Advertiser. It probably would have been Philadelphia newspapers. They would have been, uh, or, and maybe, well, Washington newspapers as well, and, and, and Baltimore newspapers, but the, they would have all had news from a, uh, on particular dates from a different angle and uh, certainly not, not not simultaneous news. There was no same news in all of these newspapers. You read them all. On the right hand of the painting, there is this clerk's desk. And above it, there were some back issues of the newspapers as well. And that reminds us that at this desk, the postmaster might have been keeping his accounts. And a postmaster's compensation based on postal revenues, the newspapers were really important for his um, remuneration. And because newspaper postage was prepaid quarterly in advance at the office of delivery, that meant that the Downingtown postmaster was especially interested in the, post, in the newspapers. The prepaid postage of postal reform was uh, was an innovation on first class or letter mail, but uh, the newspaper mail was always prepaid. Uh, the postmaster often uh, credited the subscriber with the prepayment. Uh, but as a matter of fact, in terms of the accounting with the government, newspaper postage had to be paid before the paper was even in the mail. So back to the painting again. We're talking about newspapers. So two people in the painting are reading newspapers. Oh, and look at them, they're limp. And there are no they're wrinkles limp. in them. Right. Whereas so these, these, these are not newspapers that came in the mail. Oh, 
So yeah. the, the smoke, the, the gun in the first slide. Right, yes. <laughs> right. So note, yes. no creases. Remember, the, remember the, the, the creased newspapers in the first slide? These papers are not creased. These are the limp newspapers wet as printed that may well have been, and we're supposing another hypothesis, which makes us all this story sing out, that they are local newspapers, not carried in the mail, but bought in locally. And note that the, the man on the right is reading aloud from the newspaper. And this was something that, for instance, Washington Irving noted was quite common. He describes it where the local news, the teacher would read the newspapers aloud to anybody in the... Um, and the guy on the lift may be at the same part on the page. Look at... Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> And we wanted you to notice just for fun that Crimmel, instead of signing the painting, carved his initials into the uh, table. Now, having said that, if this, these newspapers were limp and then probably then had, they didn't go through the mail and they might've even been a little damp when they were brought into the tavern. Well, who might have brought them into the tavern? What about this guy who's paint pointing at the newspaper and listening to it being read? Well, he's wearing a printer's smock, which immediately led us to think, okay, who was the newspaper publisher and printer in Downingtown at the time? And it was a man called Charles Mowbray. Um, and importantly, in 1813, the newspaper that he published was the American Republican. But before that, he started that newspaper in 1808, and it was called the Temperance Zone. And then he changed in 1809 to the American Republican, then the Downingtown American Republican, and then the American Republican. So we've got. But throughout it was. It was a temperance rag. So have a look now just at the painting as a whole. And notice as you have to with all paintings, we don't know what the source of light was intended to be, but the light is focused on the center of the painting and it's focused on this group of people the guy sitting at the table with a drink in his hand and the woman with her hand on his shoulder and presumably their child, barefoot child with his or her right hand on dad's knee. Now, there are no, there are no, there are a lot of gestures in this painting. Look at all the hands and all the gesturing, but it's the child's hands and the wife's hands that are making contact with other bodies. That is, that is, a, that's the dance, the central uh, dance of the painting is that tableau. And the, the, the other figures in the painting, see how they're arranged with respect to it. it was, the one guy is trying to uh, ignore it. Another guy is kind of quaffing his drink and has his elbow up and is looking right into it. And the reader is continuing to read. But heavens, everything is happening at once. Right, and the mail is arriving, and yeah. the guy and the is at the door, and what is going to happen here now? But there's a the, the, the scene has been brought to a different kind of focus, a crisis here in the center of this scene uh, between the intimate relations of the people who are present and the outer world as it's coming in the door, perhaps, and in the form of newspapers from a variety of places, locally and elsewhere. So. This tableau of woman, child entering a tavern and trying to convince husband, dad to come home became a, a real icon of the temperance movement much later. Uh, in the Civil War, there was a song, Father Come Home, that became really popular. Um, and what's interesting, too, is that uh, several people, when I talked about this, we said, well, no, it couldn't be temperance because the temperance movement didn't start in America until after, quite a bit after 
But that's not true. We know that in Downingtown, there was a temperance newspaper. So it's not that surprising that such a scene would be set in Downingtown. The working man is at his ease. Here he's wearing slippers instead of his work shoes, but he's still wearing his working apron. And um, I wanted to let other people know that there were mills established on Brandywine Creek in Downingtown in 1761. At one point it was called Downing's Mills. So it was a working man's town. There's that one gesture that I've circled and I wanted you to look at that gesture and the, the other gesture on the right that it's responding to. And so the, the Charles Mowbray, Mowry is gesturing, pointing to the newspaper. Come on, listen to this. And the stout gentleman in Quaker garb says, no, I'm, I. The back of his hand would be shown to, shown to Maori as a, uh, as a hold it a bit. Right. Uh, but there's something going on, perhaps in this painting, that, uh, that there's a crisis in this painting in, 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 a, in a way in which uh, the Quaker wants us to uh, step into. We wondered, however, given that we assume this is Hunt Downing, who at the town was both postmaster and owner of the tavern. We knew he was a Quaker. Um, and yet there he is with his sort of pot belly, um, sort of bursting his buttons. And um, he's in the company of, of men who are perhaps drinking a little too much. Um, whether that was a commentary on his being a Quaker and running a tavern, but we're not sure about that one. So again, back to the painting and- What could be the crisis? We're what asking could be more the crisis? deeply. What, well, what first, we no, brought... first of all, we want the timing. Yes, okay. But to look at those three circled oh, yes. elements, gotcha. okay? So we know it's 1814 because Crimmel said he finished the painting in 1814, but Crimmel was also, in many of his paintings, would paint in an almanac with the year date. And then that would, of course, date the painting. Um, and we wanted to point out that this design of the almanac was very similar to the farmer's almanac, which was published in many different cities at the time. Above the barkeep door, there was the chalk um, days of the week and the dates. So since he had chalked that in, we know that it has to be the week of Sunday the 8th to Saturday the 14th. And um, we looked at a, a perpetual. perpetual calendar and found out, well, that had to be May. And then we tracked down the surviving copies of the Maori paper, the American Republican. And that was a weekly paper that was published on Tuesdays. So we leap to the conclusion that what we've been looking at is Tuesday, May the 10th, 1814. So on that date, what might that gentleman be reading aloud in the newspaper? In the local newspaper. In the local newspaper, right. So a couple of clues on the walls of the tavern uh, were two paintings or two framed objects in any case. One is a naval battle painting. It's very dark, but you can tell that there's a battle going on in two ships and it's very similar to a painting that had been painting in 1812 um, and depicting the victory at sea of the USS Constitution over the HMS Guerriere. So that's War of 1812. We have the war context, of course, being brought to attention. 
And then also on the wall, there was a framed map, which is very similar to an 1804 map by Abraham Bradley, which showed postal routes. And then that led us to think, okay, so maybe the newspaper was reporting on the War of 1812, which at the time in 1814 could have been reporting on Major General Jacob Jennings Brown, who was leading American troops to the Niagara frontier. And that would be local news or of local importance because he was also a Quaker and he also lived in Chester County, right near Downingtown. So, so can, I, can I construct? Yep. Yeah. So what we were imagining is that the Downingtown printer gesturing to his paper in pride as the first source of publication of this news, which we, he would have intercepted on its way to being published in the Philadelphia newspapers, arriving in the door and without advantage of his connection. So having <clears throat> come to that conclusion, um, we discovered that Crimmel first exhibited this painting in Philadelphia in 1814 at the fourth annual exhibition of the Columbian Society of Artists and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And at the time he called it just simply Village Tavern. Now, in 1815, he renamed the painting, calling it Interior, the Country Stage House Tavern and Post Office with the news of peace. So he wanted the people looking at it after 1815 to look at it and jump to the conclusion that what's being read was the news that the war was over. Now it couldn't have been because we know he finished it in 1814 and the news of the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, was signed 24th of December, 1814, but it didn't arrive in Washington until February, 1815. And, and that was before news of the June defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo, which could have been something else. Oh, but, uh, just a minute, the, the, the point to this consideration is that the painting was named with the news of peace, uh, the peace of the Treaty of Ghent before Napoleon escaped from Alba and put the whole, <laughs> the world back in a in a flux of concern that wasn't ended until Waterloo, which would have been in June and would not have its notice would not have reached America until July or August. Actually, yeah, even September. So we're imagining that this painting was renamed in that interim in 1815 after Ghent news arrived, but before water before Elba, <laughs> before Napoleon escaped from Elba. It's anyway it, it, are, we are forced to make these conclusions, but they sound consistent all the way down to, the, to, to when it might possibly have been renamed. Uh, uh, that, that we could find out when in 1815 it was renamed, but uh, we, we haven't yet. Uh, no, they did. Everything we yeah. found just said but, uh, in 1815 you, you yeah, renamed yeah. it. So what's happening to Downingtown today? Well, uh, the George Washington Inn is on the National Historic Registry. And this was the map that was included with that application in the 1970s. Um, and it's showing it at the intersection of what's now the Lincoln Highway, US 30, which by it certainly in this area is the old Lancaster Turnpike and a road that goes northeast to Lionville. And the painting that I showed you before of George Washington in a village shows such a crossroads with a, a monument in the center. So having been um, pretty much convinced that Downingtown is the painting, um, we looked up the description of this particular inn in a great book that was fortunately reprinted 
um, from the copy in the New York Public Library. And in, uh, the original is 1911. And it's called The Wayside Inns on the Lancaster Roadside between Philadelphia and Lancaster. So on page 22, here's the description of our inn. It's in East Cal Township near the 31st milestone although we know it's 33 miles from Philadelphia. At the, at the time that whatever that running was. Right. Happening. It's also known as Downings or the Stage Office. And on the old distance tables is Downings Mill, 33 miles from the Philadelphia Courthouse. This noted hostelry was at the eastern end of the village of Downingtown on the north side of the Turnpike at the junction of the Lionville Road. So where it is now. This inn was the halfway station between Philadelphia and Lancaster and occupied the same position on the successive roads between these two points. Downings was a stage stand of the first order. It's not known what effigy the signboard bore during provincial days. After the revolution, however, it became known as the General Washington. And the swinging side portraying the general and a civilian standing side by side. And in the early days, the same was also a post office. So we actually recently bought a letter. Why am I getting uh, echo? Anyway. Are they getting our echo? No, no problem. We're hearing an echo. Are you hearing it too? Yeah. We're get, yeah, Sorry. we're getting a little bit of an echo. So okay. Everybody is muted, so hopefully it should maybe go away. Thank you. Okay. So this letter was written in 1852 and Philadelphia and recording his travel on the Turnpike. So I'll let you read it so I don't echo. <laughs> and there was another pattern. Uh, but not a post office. So that is the end of our presentation. We'd love to have questions. I will stop the sharing. Can we please have a phenomenal round of applause? Uh, that was absolutely spectacular, and we thank you for taking us on this journey. I, oh, I'm ready thank to you. Get, I am ready to get on a stagecoach and head out to Downingtown. Down yeah, you know, we haven't yet, which is crazy. We really must. <laughs> We've talked to dirt, but we haven't been there yet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, I lived, I lived there for 20 years. Uh, that Route 113, the road coming up uh, out of Downingtown that it was on. And do you remember seeing the... Now it's a house, it's a private residence, but the stone building that was there. I remember the stone building. I don't think I knew it was the tavern. Yeah, because it, it's now just somebody's home, so. Yes. Lucky them. What I just find amazing that you can look at the painting the way you have and through amazing research, recreate, bring this story to life. I mean, I'm never going to look at the same a painting the same way again, to be able to look at the map, the papers, the people, the gestures, the calendar, the ship. I mean, to put all of that together, right, and put yourself back in that period, to me, is absolutely just a fascinating a piece of research and history and postal history in this part of the world. And, and I think I hope everybody gets inspired <laughs> to what you share with us to be able to do that. And bring these yeah. little pieces of paper that we all look at, right, and covers and let to life, which is really what what you've done. And, and I, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm going to think of some questions, but I'm going to let others ask because I have a few. But I'm going to let others ask. Yeah. Questions, people. One that I have is when you're mentioning about genre painting and the Europeans coming over and doing it here, it almost looks like this was almost methodological to document something, to have all the symbolism in there, as Charlie was saying, you know, the map, the newspaper, on and on and on. And was that one of the uh, tenets of the genre painting? No, well, moment? it wasn't. The tenet was to find a situation in which there were several people involved, several figures that seemed quintessentially American. So Crimmel, for instance, 
Um, another of his famous paintings is uh, a country dance in, in a barn. And so there's a lot of people dancing and with the fiddle player and so on. The amazing um, thing is that these paintings were very closely observed and very, the verisimilitude was, we find high. We tend to discount that when we look back through the cliches that they have become, as we've remarked, this painting may have been the origin of a half a dozen different visual cliches, but the painting itself is a, is a, a careful uh, a sketch of life as it was observed and with these things, with, if we look at them closely and, and give, them, uh, give them a little bit of space can really start to speak uh, to us. And, and that, that's true of other genre paintings of, of the first half of the 19th century, particularly, that the detail is very true to life. And you can find, well, for instance, when I just mentioned that, that it was a certain type of stove, uh, stove collectors find that image really interesting because that's a particular kind of stove. They can track it down. Um, I didn't talk about it, but the flagon that's on the table that the uh, presumably inebriated husband slash father is drinking from, that's a particular kind of flagon that only appeared in America at about this time and so on. Mm -hmm. I find it just a phenomenal yeah, presentation. Um, but there, there was one person you didn't mention, and that was the guy behind the mailman who looks to me like he's trying to interrupt everybody and say, hey, the mail's just come. Thank you, thank you, yes. thank you. Yes, and, and you know, the, that gesture where he's, he's, he's taken off his hat and he's gesturing now, He's either gesturing, hey, guys, the stagecoach is here, or he's saying goodbye. I'm leaving on the yeah. stagecoach. Well, the, yeah. the, the, my, my, can I vote? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we noted that his gesture, he's, 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 he's heralding the arrival, I think, it's, with respect to all the other meetings the paper painting he's heralding the arrival he's got the hat he's got this red jacket he's also in the other painting uh, can we oh, go back yeah. to that can i quickly screen uh share yeah, the screen again oh yeah please do if he's in the other painting so there's consistency yeah. he was with yeah. this again a lot of forethought right yeah exactly. okay so this is let me see where it first is where it's the largest no here, no, yes, here. Okay, have a look at the painting again. And I've I've put a little red, can you yeah. see? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So sure here, look can. at this, here's the same kind. Now here they're obviously saying huzzah to mm -hmm. George Washington, but that man in the red jacket with he's got a handkerchief in his hand here but he's he's that's the, the kind of gesture and uh here's another man here with his hat in the air with a kind of wine color jacket um here's another but this gesture particularly and also the way that the um the people's faces in this smaller painting um, are not terribly well delineated, which seemed to me to be quite a bit like here. I mean, these aren't carefully crafted faces. Well, it might be. Well, those two well, faces, yeah. No, no, these two yeah, yeah. are much, and, and they actually look quite a, a lot more like the figures in the painting here, especially the hands um, that are a little more clumsy than the hands that we were looking at later on. You know, this this man's hand is much more carefully done as this one. So yeah, the the, the that gestural um, the kind of moon face is common in those figures. And here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, yeah. in here, just the sort of moon faces. Yeah. 
So this is only attributed to Crimmel, but I say, uh-huh, looks a lot like a Crimmel, Crimmel, Crimmel <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these American genre paintings were popular enough that they were reproduced um, in lithograph form and then sold, mm -hmm. uh, and they were very popular in Europe. Was this one reproduced in Europe? No, this one was not, but many of them at the time were. Can I ask a question now about this station, halfway between Philly and Lancaster? Yeah. And maybe you said this at the beginning, and when I go and I look at the presentation later when you share it for a couple of hours, maybe I'll get it. Um, you, the presumption is that they had to be coming from Philly here and not west to east. Did you well, clarify you know that, right? That you know. No, I don't know that, but... It, it, it fits our story. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. Fantastic. That's just what I wanted to hear. So it is just the quid. They could be coming from Lancaster to Downingtown on their way yeah. to Philly or, right? Is that true? Well, yes. Yeah, but given that Crimmel himself <laughs> is living in Philadelphia... Yes, yes. And he has to go to this place to paint it. Yes, yes. Then it's more likely that that he's painting that. No, I, I like the theory, your diagnosis. I'm a scientist. You've gone down the path. You've sold me. Um, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. But it's interesting because you could clearly come from the other way. This is right in the middle of two very important. It might be worth examining, you see, because yes. uh, the papers might be coming from Baltimore by way of Tomlinson stage from Baltimore to Lan to Chambersburg and back to Lancaster. Yes, but yes. My, we're presumption is that the Lancaster, the Philadelphia papers are going to be more more important to to and be more, more heralded and more subscribers yes. there. You see in the basket. Well, as a New Yorker that's moved here to Lancaster eight years ago, I know how important this particular city is to Lancastrians, and that being the oldest inland city. Oh, right? yeah. I'm just saying, in the capital for a day. I mean, so you're right. I mean, there's equivalency between. Yes, yes, Philly important, but Lancaster as well, right? Yeah. That well, same kind of prominence. So yes. it's very interesting that you're right. You, you've you got news coming in from both ends. Yeah. And right? that's a very important thing. To, I mean, we, we understand this now with respect to interplanetary news, but it's going to be arriving at different times by different routes. By different uh, routes, yes. yes. Yeah. And of course, that's the first turnpike between the two cities. Yeah. Yes, yes. Again, I'm just staggered. I'm going to have to absorb this. Anybody else, please, with a few questions. I, I you know, I want to get a lot of too, is um, when you're looking at kind of heralding the mail, anybody's been in the service, uh, at least when you start out, they have mail call and you got a bunch of people standing around and they're shouting out your name over and over and over and you maybe get a package and you have a lot more new friends than you didn't have before you got the package. But you know, it's almost like that kind of festive environment. And yes. sometimes people got, you know, their little town newspapers rolled back. You know, I'm going back to the 60s, but yeah. they're very, very similar. Yeah. It's a, and it was the, uh, the, the presentation, we had three such genre paintings. One was 1848 and the other 49. They were all similarly a cluster of a half a dozen or 10 people about a newspaper which was being read from a mail just received. And in, in the other cases, the newspapers were wrinkled. <laughs> they come by the mail. The, the crucial thing here was that it was a local paper. <laughs> well, you know, when I looked at that uh, basket at first, it looked like it had been those little white squashes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at first, yeah, you picked up beside the road. Yeah. By the yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very good. Me envision that's how service still is in Sand Lake, New York, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Our service. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yes. Questions, so I, anybody? Yeah, I, I, I want to clarify because I think you said uh, where I know. I mean, I know the Smithsonian. We know the NPM. We know where the painting. The original is there. Is no, that no, true? no. The original is in Toledo. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. all right. Got it. Toledo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, with permission. <laughs> yes. Um, they because we also got permission to have a very high resolution scan which is mm -hmm. how we were able to see some of the detail including those those bundles of newspapers which yes. looked a lot more like bread dough in <laughs> in in the uh, mm -hmm. scan that you get online um but the smithsonian got permission 
to reproduce it and hang it on the wall. And, and hang it. So the one in Toledo too, because I mean, you know, we know how paintings over time age and get discolored on a surface, et cetera. If it were, because it seems a little bit dark in some of those backlit areas too, if it were to be restored too, you might even have more clarity of the battleship, the map on the wall as well. I mean, all of those subtle pieces, but with the high resolution that you shared, you were able to, I think, clearly demonstrate and show and convince that that's what those images were, yeah. Um, right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good Question on the, on the newspapers. Um, what was the reading level there? In the United States, the United States at that time was the most literate country in the world. Okay. It was a system of common education. It certainly was spotty and different with respect to class and gender, but in general, the, the, the most literate country in the world. Newspapers were expensive. And so they were only subscribed to by people who had means. And indeed, the largest payers of postage would have been subscribers of newspapers. Other people would have sat around waiting for their one or two letters a year and listening to the newspapers from their more affluent, the lawyers and the doctors mm -hmm. and the other people who had professional means of making money and scrabbling together enough to prepay 52 cents for a weekly paper you know yeah, and those are bankers and merchants and right those that were involved in that sort of business right. railroaders etc right because you know they were looking for prices current they were looking for ships sailing in and out and and all of those other components and pieces right from a, a merchant and trade perspective too and of course uh tavern owners would yes. want to subscribe because it brought people in to listen to the news in the tavern. Yeah, and if you had a blocker, yeah. And as Washington Irvin in Rip Van Winkle, he described it as this was an entertainment. Yeah, there was a recent movie about the the, news, the reader of newspapers. Oh, was that, right. Was that the one with Tom Hanks? Yes. He's traveling and he's yes. reading, right? Yes. yes. That's really sweet. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> newspaper in every town he went to. That's right. Yeah. He read to everybody everywhere the news of it. And it was entertainment. He was on a little stage and he just was barking out all yeah. of the. And you would yeah. gather around. I mean, that was how you got your information, correct? Yeah. So yeah. that was very yeah. well done. At the college where I used to work, we had an art professor who did his doctoral dissertation on uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper. And he was explaining to me that in a largely preliterate society, that there were well-known conventions of the meaning of gestures and colors and symbology. And that, uh, Today, we think of paintings as evoking a mood or a feeling. But he said in that, in these uh, largely illiterate societies, paintings were also used to convey a great deal of information, not just a mood or a feeling. Great point. So uh, as I saw, you know, listen to your amazing uh, explication of all of the details in this painting, I kept thinking back about what I'd heard from uh, this art professor. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I particularly- and Thank you for putting it that way. It is a, a different, coming from a different direction, perhaps both directions are important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think particularly that central image of uh, the temperance image, that this is the first time that it appears and then it gets, you can, Google it and it just it goes, there are still today <laughs> cartoons showing somebody going into a bar saying, come home. Um, but this this was the first one. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I loved it. Thank you. Huh? Questions, any other, people? Any other questions, please? Comments? I want to know when you're coming back, because I know oh. you have another painting. <laughs> You've yeah, done You've done another painting on us, and you're definitely yeah. going to want to come. We have other paintings, but we have other lithographs, too. You just wait. Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, that that same place in Italy sent out a call for papers last year. Yes. And uh, having I, everybody in Italy really liked the presentation, too, and found it very unusual. And so they chose to uh, publish it in their proceedings. Um, and it went to 
various. Uh, uh, and uh, Peter Martin at La Posta published a mon monograph which included the explication more or less of Vigna to you, as well as for the other two uh, genre paintings uh, that we presented uh, at, at Italy. Anyway, so the, the call for papers this time, we thought, well, we've got to do something visual because now we've become kind of attached to that. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a, a series of chromolithographs that ended up advertising a postal route through part of the Rockies in um, Colorado that even the route is a ghost route now. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Actually, there are four lithographs and they're, they're these Eastern stagecoach entrepreneurs who are fighting it out into the West, in the West, last gasp, railroads are coming in, but they're serving the most remote areas. These mining camps that are breaking out in the tops of the mountains, they're the stagecoaches that are going there. And this lithograph shows stagecoaches with people on the coaches on a mountain, and the mountain in one of them is Mount Shasta, and another one is Mount Uncompagre. Same and, mountain, and they're same, just same, same repurposing lithograph. it. Yeah, different routes. Anyway. So it's a lot of fun of this sort. Yeah. <laughs> so. Just to uh, get the... Uh... The infomercial out, you're mentioning how the painting resides in Toledo, and we have a speaker. I don't know if Dave Plunkett's here. I have a, a one page of it, I'll show later. He but is. Dave is here. Dave is, is here. Is he David here? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show it and then he'll tell about it. But it's, he'll be doing a presentation on the postal history of the Toledos of the world. Oh, so, nice. If you can hang. Yeah, and when we get into our section on, um, you know, tonight on show and tell and ask, you know, you know, we hope you can stay with us and, and join us and show something if you want. But uh, I'll be popping up that uh, that image uh, for Dave to just share with us. Just kind of give her, just a little bit of a teaser for what's coming up uh, in a month or two. So thank we you. have a round of applause, please, for our phenomenal speakers. I mean, this really. I'm going to keep my mic on so you can hear the applause. <laughs> and, and we and we absolutely thank you. This probably I mean, we've heard a lot of great. Uh, this just really, I think, was unique in, in so many respects and aspects. And I think it has given us a new appreciation for uh, how we should, I think, Mick, you also put it well, to look at images from this era and from this period uh, and kind of have a different respect for them and kind of go down this investigative pathway. I'm just really, really excited about this. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, you most welcome. At our best. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anyway, I, we're not going to stay with you. We're uh, going to leave you, but thank you so much for inviting us. Thank well, you. thank you very much. And we hope thank you can you. join us again and visit anytime. It's so, glad. It's so good you. to be with you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I said, uh, our, our speakers say it's like being at their own stamp club. You know, we have a, yes, yeah. a great yeah. bunch of warm people. We yeah. have yeah. a stamp club here that we, yeah. yeah. Yep. Great people. Thank have a good evening. Okay. Thank well, you. Thanks, Rob and Diane. Thank you again. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye now. Bye -bye. Hey, I, I want to say a little welcome because I missed this. That was phenomenal. I don't even know. I'm still yes. kind of blown away by that. That was just absolutely one of the best presentations we have. We've probably all been exposed to first from that sideways too. enough for you, Charlie. That was totally, man. I'll tell you, not talk about a grand slam. Just phenomenal. Uh, I really yeah, appreciate their, their courses at uh, AP were great. I mean, you get a week of that yes. stuff. This yep. is the stuff that they pull out from that, that they can put it all together and analyze it separately and then together and come out with a whole. So you, you just gained a whole block. Uh, of, absolutely. Of I mean, I think it's yeah. like you, I saw them 15 years ago. It, ha it was a long time ago at the APS up at the match factory when I first was exposed to, you know, uh, what the, the, the uh, their approach and th this sort of presentation. I think it's just, again, it adds so much more richness Mm -hmm. to kind of our area, our hobby, what we do and what we research. We like the stamps. We like the covers. We like the letters. We like the rates and routes. I think this really kind of brings it all together. And that painting is a phenomenal example. Well, um, one of the examples of the things that they did at one of the courses, they had a map of the United States with several overlays. And one of the first ones was kind of like Indian trails. And then seemingly following those were the, the, the dirt turnpikes. Following those were the railroads, following those were the telegraphs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the rail, the air flights followed those, but seeing it overlaid, you know, 
taking those separate facts and putting them together again, this this, this yeah. phenomenal. Well, I agree. So thank you, everybody. That was good. I know we have more now. Uh, a little.